So just before I get started, I wanted to show you this amazing, beautiful waterfall. Can't record here because it's too loud, but it's definitely worth you seeing for sure. We're gonna go upstream into the forest adjacent to this, this river here, but I just wanted to show you this waterfall. It's pretty beautiful. It slides underneath this bridge and comes out over here. Love the water, protect it, honor it. I mean, without water, there is no life. Hello, how's it going, friends? Well, here we are again, and today I want to continue to expand on my background essentially and allow you to get to know me a little bit better give you a little bit more context on uh, you know how this all began and and um, just bring you up to the current moment and uh, my experiences and uh, and what I have to share so here we go so hey friends how's it going uh, yeah I just wanted to continue to expand on uh, my first video, which was a very brief and basic introduction, a very thin outline of why I'm starting my channel, what I'm about, and the intentions behind it. So today I'd like to expand a little bit on, you know, my background and, you know, the, the adventure and uh, journey that brought me to this point in my life. Ever since I was a child, I've had these really incredible, um, powerful and lucid visions and dreams, um, some of which I connected with different beings. Um, I remember having conversations with spirit beings before I came into my body. These are memories that exist prior to me being in this physical form in this lifetime. And, you know, that led me out to um, feel a sense of security and support and understanding. Um, I was ultimately confused, of course. I was quite young. But, uh, you know, initially it was very, very scary and confusing. And I was alone. And at that time, you know, there wasn't a lot of talk around spirituality or consciousness and so on and so forth. So I really had no one to reflect with about this stuff. I had to process it all internally. Anyhow, um, music has been a huge part of my life and you'll see that and hear that come up quite a bit. The music journey started when, as early as grade four, believe it or not. I used to go into the uh, library and uh, park myself in the hallways um, during recess and lunch hours and play 45s and play disco and funk and, and uh, you know, dance tracks and so forth for my classmates and peers. And uh, that led me all the way through uh, high school. We had a high school radio station, in fact, that I used to play two or three hours a day, broadcast into the cafeteria. Um, everything from rock and alternative into the early years of electronica. Um, and that continued into school dances, which brought me to open up a nightclub right out of high school, pretty much, uh, when I was 19, 20 years old. Um, I uh, then, after I had my club, I helped a friend manage one. There were all ages nightclubs, by the way. People used to come um, from ages of 14, 15 to 40 years old. Okay, and there was no alcohol being served. People did their thing. They caught a buzz before they showed up, and it was ultimately just a place to socialize, connect, and dance. And we'd go from eight at night until eight in the morning every Friday and Saturday, and it was incredible. And this was before the term rave even existed. And from there, I went back down to Toronto. This was outside of Toronto. Uh, I moved outside of the city for, uh, for a couple years. I went back down to Toronto after I closed my club and, and got involved in the what we call Toronto rave scene. Um, helped to pioneer that. Worked with Destiny, Delirium, um, Alien, uh, Transcendence, tons of amazing people and um, promoters. And I started my own promotion company called Resonance and we started some conscious events 
a little bit more intention. We had a chill room, ambient room, and then a dance room. So, you know, the ambient room had, uh, you know, yoga and massage and aromatherapy and crystals and altars and everything set up. Very organic, very grounded, uh, very conscious environment. And then uh, the dance room would just be like, you know, a couple lights, a strobe, a pounding sound system and ecstatic techno and house. So uh, we carried that forth. We did three of them. And then eventually that became uh, the Ohm Festival, which I helped with the first one. And then I subsequently moved out west after the first uh, Ohm Festival. So, yeah, I was doing full moon parties on Cherry Beach, which I eventually brought out west when I moved out west, as I'd mentioned in my first video. Um, you know, I noticed that after doing a, an event in Toronto for tomogamy to stop the old growth logging of the last remaining uh, white pines, I worked with a collective or organization called Earth Roots and um, recognized that that was a very effective way of bringing people together and sharing information and promoting change. Um, and so I brought that formula out west and began to implement and apply that uh, to try and help save the forest out west. Um, I mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the, you know, serious uh, motivators and uh, reasons for me to be propelled out west was uh, witnessing an old growth cross section of a stump in a shopping mall, which was about 25 feet wide stunning i've never seen anything like it at the time brought me to tears um i just couldn't allow that uh with knowing what i know and the passions that i have in serving and protecting this earth i just wouldn't have it and i did everything in my power to get out here as fast as possible and apply that uh, to uh doing some events here at west so started off with full moons in the Ilaho. um one of the things that made me fall in love with BC was the full moon gathering that I did with uh, Moon Tribe out at Souk on the island. Um, it was amazing, incredible. The people, the vibe, the mountains, the trees. That was it. Sealed the deal. I moved out west about a month later. Um, and yeah, I started with BC Eco Events. This guy named Damien Kettlewell. We did some events up in the Ilaho Valley, raised tons of awareness to stop the old growth logging up in the Ilaho Valley. And then I moved forward to work with the Sierra Club. I initiated and organized a caravan for the Great Bear Rainforest to stop the old growth logging there. Uh, the Great Bear Rainforest is the last intact temperate rainforest on the planet. And it's the home of the Kermode spirit bear, the white spirit bear. Uh, it's the only place in the world where you'll find them and it's a very very magical precious place so i'm sure you can imagine and appreciate why i felt so much passion to protect that after the Ilaho events and so forth we did some events called reconvergence of the tribes which is a tie-in to gathering of the tribes from la bringing together conscious collectives artists and promoters from all over north america bringing them together in the Ilaho, and we did that for three years which then later inspired me um, to continue with some caravans, which I initiated in 2001 after launching the campaign for the new time in Vancouver with Jose and Lloydine Arguez and my beautiful friend, Corey. Um, so yeah, that, uh, that conference, a three-day conference, a campaign for the new time, um, it was a three-day campaign or three-day conference, sorry, and uh, I received a very powerful message and vision after that to start a caravan and travel through North America to spread the message and to raise inspiration and unify people and share the messages of natural time and prophecy and as well bring together community and promote sustainability and yeah living with intention so the caravans lasted for four years and then they brought me through mexico and basically i went from vancouver all the way down to southern mexico um, down to the yucatan peninsula four years in a row and 
from there met many, many amazing friends who I still have strong friendships with um, and teachers. And I was introduced to these teachers through um, events and meeting with these people, um, friends of friends, essentially. Didn't go looking for them. As I mentioned, they found me and I guess I was ready and we created a very strong trusting bond and I was very fortunate to uh, to align with these elders and that's how I created these relationships and I'll share their their names and images their pictures and uh, specifically what I learned from them and and what I apprenticed with them um, but yeah after meeting those elders everything just continued to snowball I thought I was done uh, I was gonna just basically rest and figure out where I was going to settle in. I ultimately went down to Mexico for 16 winters. It was incredible. Come back to Vancouver in the summer, work in the entertainment industry, squirrel away a bit of money, go back down to Mexico and continue my work. Um, so yeah, the caravans led to an event called 7777. And from there I met uh, my two Wichol teachers, Don Custodio and Don Jose Luis. Um, both of them showed up on the first and second events without me contacting them. They just magically and ultimately showed up at my door and told me they heard the call. And of, of course they did. And, uh, you know, nothing is surprising when it comes to the medicine world and working with these powerful elders. And ultimately that's how my relationships came together with them. Um, I did eight years apprentice with uh, Custodio and roughly 12, 13 years with Jose Luis and I still work with Jose Luis uh, Ramirez. Um, sadly, Don Custodio passed away about a month and a half ago. He was 100 years old so he lived a very good life but I still am in touch with his family and I still have plans to um, bring them into my circles and continue um, including them in ceremony. Uh, through these events, I also met Wayne Lee, who is a Navajo Diné uh, roadman. He studied with Emerson Jackson, who was the chief of the Native American church for 30 years. Wayne was basically thrown into the fire after Emerson uh, unfortunately got into a car accident one night and couldn't make it to ceremony. He instructed Wayne to go and informed him that he was ready and that he needed to facilitate the ceremony. So um, Wayne is an incredibly beautiful man. His words are nectar. I tell him when he speaks, it's like Cupid. You know, his words just hit you straight in the heart and they're incredibly profound and beautiful. Um, and you'll meet him at some point too. Um, another amazing, incredible elder who I hold dear dearly in my heart, his name is Sutting Sun White Bear. And I met him uh, in Sayulita during the 7777 events and he and I, his name was Steve Crawford, uh, formed a very, very tight, loving relationship and he was ultimately sharing and passing on the teachings of the Anishinaabe people and the origins and history of the wigwam, also known as the sweat lodge in their tradition and the story of Ska Bay and the beginning of life, story of creation. We'll get more into that too. Um, so yeah, from there, um, in around 2005, 2006, I received an anonymous email which uh, aligned me and had me questioning for quite some time to uh, respond to a message from the Hopi elders the return of the true white brother and they also call that Pahana and essentially took me a long time of self-judgment and questioning before I surrendered to that and went there. It was very very powerful, very emotional. Um, I had to consult with a lot of friends and elders as well as my heart to really really look deep and to question because I kept asking myself why am I, who am I why am I so important that I'm going to go and answer this call and, and uh, tell these people that I'm going to help them and carry these messages and, and uh, receive these teachings. So ultimately I gained enough support and courage and I took the leap of faith and I went down and I 
connected with Grandfather Martin Geshelema, and we formed a very, very powerful relationship. And I had the great fortune and blessing to study with him for six years. Um, sadly, Grandfather Martin has since passed, and uh, it gives even more urgency and reason. Um, for me to want to share these teachings. The return path messages is something that I'm going to share coming up very shortly in the future. It's a very long message, so it's going to be a sequence of a few videos. And it ultimately shares teachings, messages, warnings, and prophecies about our current times that we're actually experiencing right now. And it maps it out so accurately and so profoundly. It's incredible how accurate this information is, how accurate these prophecies are, and the fact that they've been around for 15 to 20,000 years. How would they know things like that way back when technologies didn't even exist? Okay, so I wanna share that with you, and Grandfather Martin clearly stated before my, my last session with him that these teachings are not owned by the Hopi, they are kept by the Hopi. And they were asked by Masao to be the keepers and guardians of the earth. And these messages and teachings are for the people to help us walk in balance. And I look forward to sharing that with you. Thank you again for your time, attention, and respect. I hope these videos are inspiring you. Please like and share, and most importantly, subscribe, because without subscribing, the channel will not grow and it won't catch on and the people that need to receive this information and, and get inspired and uh, build their hope back up and perhaps live vicariously through this experience they need to receive it too and uh, well ultimately that's the whole reason why i'm doing this right so you guys have an awesome day lots of love thank you again in lakesh one love boom